You would open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1, and I have uh, more than once this morning mentioned we're going to be talking about Jesus as light of the world, Jesus as, uh, as, as it's another one of the metaphors the New Testament uses for Jesus, and we're going to, no pun intended, with light you get all kinds of opportunities to uh, have a play on words, but we're going to look into this a little deeper and see what maybe this is talking about. So John chapter 1, verse 1, most of us are very familiar with this passage. I'm going to read it down through about verse 13. Uh, the focus this morning is going to be on Jesus' light, but I want you to see when this light is present, uh, things that, that light is shed upon. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. A man came, one sent from John, uh, from God, and his name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. Him is John the Baptist. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. This was the true light that coming into the world enlightens every person. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, those who believe in his name, to who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then we remember later on in the gospel, the verse we read together a while ago in John chapter 8. I'll just read it again. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. John begins his gospel by uh, likening or, or claiming that Jesus is three things. He says he is the word, and what that means is, is that in Jesus God speaks. He is the life, and Jesus is the fountain or the wellspring of eternal life. We have the hope, the promise of eternal life. It all originates in the person of Jesus Christ. And then he says he is the light. And what John is saying, John the Apostle is saying, is that in Jesus Christ, spiritual truths are illuminated and they become perceptible and they become knowable. I found it interesting when I was preparing this, this sermon this week. Do you know the first quoted words we have in Scripture, the first quoted words of God in Scripture, or what? I am. No. Genesis. Let there be light. Let there be light. We have two instances where actually the personhood of Jesus, uh, it did involve light as we understand it. One was at the Transfiguration. You can, you can read about that in the three synoptics where this brilliant light shone on them. Remember, it, it terrified them. And then a, a second place that came to mind was uh, on Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Anybody, you can read that in Acts, I think it's chapter 9, where there was such a bright light that it actually blinded uh, Paul. It affected his eyesight. I think later on when he was talking about um, uh, uh, some things in some of his other epistles, I don't think his eyesight was ever uh, completely restored from this. It was such a bright light. So, I don't know that that is the element of light that I want us to focus on this morning. Let's, let's first, I said earlier, to understand a metaphor, we first have to understand the metaphor. Frankly, there's a whole lot of things about light we don't understand. There's a few things we do understand. We know that light is luminous energy. Light is energy that we can perceive with our eyesight. It is, it's visible to, to people who, who can see that's unlike some forms of energy. I was raised on a dairy farm. If you've ever unplugged an electric fence to go out to work on that electric fence and you're just grabbing it and doing what you got to do with the fence because it's unplugged and there's no energy in, in that wire, 
When somebody back at the barn notices that it's unplugged and thinks somebody just accidentally unplugged that thing and, and does a good deed and plugs it back and you're out there working on it, you don't see that energy. <laughs> you feel it, but you don't see it. You don't see that somebody turned that energy back on. But light is visible energy. Without getting too far into the physics, we know that unreflected light, uh, we know that reflected light travels uh, a little better than, a, than 100, what is it, 182,000 miles an hour. I wrote that number down because, yeah, 186,000 miles an hour. A little better than that. We can measure the speed of light when it's reflected, and the way we measure that is, is we, we've got instruments that know when we turn it on and, and know when we see it, we can measure that time. Is that important? Yes, it's kind of important in Christian apologetics now because there is in, if you study uh, uh, the cosmological arguments for the existence of God, we do deal with this thing that's called the starlight problem. And particularly those of us who believe that the universe is a relatively young universe. I'm, I'm very much on board with Ken Ham, what they do at Answers in Genesis, that this is a relatively young uh, universe. The starlight problem deals with the fact that from the way we measure distance, one other thing we know about light is it acts as both a particle and a wave. You can, you can, it's, it's a particle, but it also acts like a radio wave, and the mathematics for all of that works for both. They, it, it's not really either or, it looks like it's both and, from what we can tell based on the knowledge we have today. But you've got this problem with, with what's called the starlight problem in that the way we measure distance using light as a wave, it does look like the farthest light, the furthest out light we can detect is about 14 billion light years away, which would indicate that we have a 14 billion year old Earth rather than a young Earth. Why is this a problem? Because we have to come up with some kind of plausible answer for that. Now, Dr. Jason Lyle, who you'll see on our uh, Road Trip to, to Truth series, a physicist, a, a, a very smart individual, he kind of goes along the line that, well, we have not measured unreflected light, direct light. We, do, we can't do that. We can't just look at it from the side, see how fast it's traveling. And his, he leans toward the idea that light travels faster unreflected than it does reflected, and that the 186,000 miles a second is not the right math. I, I really lean another way on this. I actually go to Jesus' first miracle at Cana where he turned water into wine and also some, other, some of his other miracles to argue that, no, he just created it all in that state. I, I believe that in Genesis 2 and 3, he didn't create just acorns. He created oak trees. He didn't, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I believe the chicken came first. I believe he created with the word of his mouth, with the decree, fully formed adult things. And I go to the miracle, I said, well, what's that got to do with him turning water into wine at Cana? How often does God turn water into wine? Every year. Every year God turns water into wine. But there's a process. Rain falls on the soil, the grapevine takes it up, there's water in the grape, and through a series of process, through a process, and through time, it becomes wine. How often does God calm a storm? Every time there is one. They eventually dissipate. They eventually lose their energy. They calm down. We, we had one pass through last night. We still got some after effects with some cloudiness this morning. But God calms all storms, but he does it through a process, through time. In Jesus' miracles, many of them, he bypassed the time element. And I believe that's what's happened with Starlight. So, I went off on a tangent there. Well, other things we know about light. We, we know that, that without light, we cannot perceive. We, we have no vision. We cannot perceive colors. We have to have light to perceive colors. There's just all kinds of things about light that, that uh, we kind of take for granted. Another weird thing about light, did you know light can bend? 
Do you know when you pass light by an by a, a object with a lot of mass, say a really big planet, it actually bends light. The gravity affects light. It's called gravitational lensing. All kinds of weird things about light. Jesus says, I am light. I don't know that Jesus was talking about the physical elements of light there. I think what Jesus was saying there was that by me and through me, you will perceive and understand what the real truth is. He said in another place, he said, I am the truth. And if you want to get at truth, you cannot get at spiritual truth apart from Jesus Christ. And where you're going to end up is like that church of the river. And you're trying to find man's definition of truth and what feels good to man, what makes sense to man. And Jesus says, no, if you want to know the real truth, if you want to know the real truth, I am the light. Well, what spiritual truths are illuminated in John chapter 1? I've picked out five things this morning I want to look at. The first four we'll go through pretty briefly. The last one I do want to spend just a couple of moments on because I think that all the application of today's message is going to be in that last point, what we have to walk out here with and kind of have our fingers around and know what to do with, if you will. But there's five elements of spiritual truth that I think are illuminated for us in those first 13 verses that I just read that we need to stop and talk about. The first one being... Jesus, as light, reveals to us, illuminates for us the true nature of himself. We see there in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. What is he saying about himself? He's saying, I am eternal. I'm going to illuminate for you the fact I am eternal. We also see very plainly, it should have jumped out at you off the page, is that Jesus is the Creator. Verse 3, apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. Look down to verse 10. And the world came into being through him. Jesus is the creator. And then obviously we see Jesus is none other than God himself. Bob, now I'll jump on your statement. Jesus is the great I am. Verse 1, the word was with God and the word was what? The word was God. Couldn't be plainer. Sometime at home, go to Colossians chapter 1 and notice the parallels between the first chapter of John's gospel and the first chapter of Colossians. I, I, this has never, never really dawned on me until recently. Colossians was written before the gospel of John. It was the last gospel written. I wonder, I, there's no way that the apostle John was not familiar with the letter to the Colossian church, that, that he wouldn't have seen that, and how much influence it would have had on him in writing this first chapter of his gospel. But from Colossians, but I, let me do it this way. I'm going I'm to read John's statement in John chapter 1 that I just read. I want to read you a parallel verse in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Colossians 1.17, he is before all things. Verse 3 of John, apart from him not even one thing came into being that has come into being. Verse 10, and the world came into being through him. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. John chapter 1, what I just read, the word was with God and the word was God. Colossians 1, 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Just go home and do some study on that. Colossians chapter 1 and John chapter 1 mirror each other. They, they really do. They say the same things in, in different ways. A lot of people don't, don't, they're not even aware of that connection. So, one thing that is illuminated is the true nature of Christ. He's eternal. He's eternal. He is the creator. And he is God. Second thing that may have jumped out at you in the passage I read from John chapter 1 is the true nature of sin and sinners. And boy, this is something the church really needs to educate itself upon when they go about trying to strategize their evangelism efforts. Their, their evangelistic efforts. And when they go out and they try to evangelize, the church does not truly understand, I think in a lot of ca cases, the true nature of sinners and their sin. 
Verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. Verse 10. The world did not know him. Verse 11. His own people did not accept him. What have we just learned about sinners? They don't grasp him. They don't know him. They don't accept him. Why? John tells us this a little later in the gospel. You don't have to turn it there. But the reason sinners, they don't grasp Jesus. They don't know him. And they do not accept him. is because John tells us that Jesus said in John chapter 3, 19, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Sinners hate the light because they don't want their sins exposed. Jesus said in 3.20, For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that his deeds will not be exposed. And Paul elaborates on this in the first chapter of Romans. He, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth in their sin. Folks, the biggest mistake I ever made coming out of seminary, I had, I had grown up in church. Most of you know that. I was born on Monday, June 26, 1961. That next Sunday, which would have been July 1st or 2nd, I was in church. I was in church. I don't think my umbilical cord had come off yet from the first time I was in church. That's just, that was the Hammond way. I never one time remember waking up on Sunday morning asking if we were going to church. And I had grown up in the Christian worldview. And I, and you know, had a, I guess as good an understanding of the Christian worldview as most people raised in church. And when I got to college and started taking sciences and looking at 14 billion year old starlight and these sorts of things, I really started to question wow, is my worldview built on truth or is this a nostalgic, romantic kind of religion that's got some good stories to it that we hope are true? And it wasn't until I got uh, later on that I got introduced to Christian apologetics and I started looking at all these things, the cosmological arguments and the teleological arguments, the <laughs> ontological arguments, and then after the, if that wasn't confusing enough, then what's called the TAG, T-A-G, the Transcendental Argument for God, which, which is pretty philosophical and, and gets into some real heady stuff. Then I came to realize, yes, that there are very sound, logical, rational arguments for believing in God and for believing that we are actually holding the word of truth. And the mistake I made was I was under the impression or the belief that people wanted to believe in God. They wanted to believe that Jesus Christ was his son. They wanted to believe in, in, in the God Christianity proclaimed, but it had just never been presented to them in a way that they felt comfortable or could have enough faith to put both feet on that rock and have confidence that what they were putting faith in was truly true. And here I go with all this, this apologetic study, and I'm going to get the word out to the world, yes, you can believe, and here's why you can believe, and here's why you can know that you know the truth, and that that's what people were hungry for. I thought they... They wanted to believe in God, just nobody had been smart enough to tell them why they could, and here I was to save the day. And what did I run into? People don't want to believe in God. People don't want to accept Christianity. Why? Right back in Genesis chapter 3, they want to be their own gods. They want to decide for themselves what's the truth, what's false. They want to decide for themselves what makes sense. Just like this so-called fake church that I took the signs of yesterday. They want to determine for themselves where truth lies. That was Satan's original temptation to Eve. You can be your own God. You can decide these things for yourself. And what I found out in the world was 
Nothing's changed. People want to be arbiters of their own truth. They want to be wise in their own eyes. Who said a while ago, one of the two of you, that we see things from our perspective. And what do we end up doing? Even Christians end up doing this. We end up creating God in whose image? Ours. He likes our kind of music. He likes our kind of worship service. He likes our favorite Bible verses. Even we as born-again believers are very, very prone to creating God in our own image. And I think that's going to be one of the rudest awakenings for all of us when we get up there and come before his presence. So, John eliminates for us that when Jesus brings his light into the situation, only by contrast with Jesus do we see the true nature of sin and of sinners. Third thing John brings a lot, I'll be very brief, but the third one, he, he, he eliminates for us the true nature of the believer's relationship with God. The true nature of our relationship with God. What's the believer's true relationship with God? We're given the right to be sons of God. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. I've preached through the Beatitudes here before. In the Beatitudes, we really see a breakdown of what happens at conversion. Through the Beatitudes, we see the attitudes and the mindset of people who have truly are truly being born again, who are becoming, if you want the technical word for it, who are becoming regenerate. Not just believers in mouth, but believers truly born again, spiritually born again believers. We see that breakdown. Matthew said, and he's talking about peacemakers, they're peacemakers. They proclaim a message of peace, peace with God, this wrath of God that's revealed against sin and unrighteousness. True believers go out and try to make peace between that person that where they stand with God and in making peace with him. And he said, peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the people. I didn't say blessed. It's blessed. It's blessed everywhere in the world except scripture. And then it's, then it's blessed. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Paul in Galatians 4 or 5, so that they, he might redeem those who were under the, under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Galatians 4, the next verse, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. The true believer has a son-daughter relationship with God the Father. And I'm running out of time, but, but I had notes here I was going to talk about. I will send out an outline today. You'll get the outline to this. If you are not on the email list, if you will write that down on the corner of your bulletin, tear that off and give it to me, you will get today's sermon outline. So, several of you are on the list. I, I don't know if y'all are or not, Darrell, but if you want to get it, write down my email. Write down your email. I'll get it on my list. But it talks about we are now joint heirs with Christ. We, we are actually a due an inheritance because we are God's children. I'm going to move on and not spend time on that. And just very quickly then we see in this first chapter the true nature of salvation. And we see that salvation is inseparable from right belief. It's inseparable from right belief. Look at verse 12. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, those who believe in his name. Then a couple of chapters over, Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus, and he, and he said this to Nicodemus. He said, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes will have eternal life. And he goes right into the most famous verse in the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So the true Christian message, the true gospel goes after what people believe. I'm going to talk about that more in just a second. And then I have no time at all to get into this today. But it is eliminated for us, whether we like it or not. A lot of us don't like this. 
but you're going to have to argue against scripture if you want to take another tack on this. And I know this separates evangelicals and has and become quite a point of contention in the Southern Baptist Convention, the church I come out of. But it is illuminated for us. Salvation is a sovereign act that results from the will of God. And he could not say that any plainer. Verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And Jesus expounded on this when he was talking to Nicodemus over a couple of chapters later. Verse 3, Jesus said this, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. You can perceive the effects of it, but you do not know where it's coming from and where it's going. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. Salvation is a sovereign act of God. It's a mystery in how it works. Are the children of God predestined to be that? Yes, Scripture makes that plain. Is man held accountable for when he rejects that? Yes, he is. Scripture makes that plain. And I've heard no one say this any better than John MacArthur. He says, those seem to be opposing facts in Scripture. It's a mystery. He says, I don't understand it. But all I can come away with is I have to believe both 100%. Maybe this will be cleared up in the, in the next dimension. But it is a mystery how it works. But you absolutely cannot take the Bible and argue against that God has sovereignly chosen to redeem and save to, for his own glory, for his own exaltation and praise, he has chosen to save certain lost sinners from a doomed race. And that's absolute scriptural truth. I don't like it. John Calvin didn't like it. We call it Calvinism. He hated the doctrine. But he says you cannot teach around it. So, those are the first four things that John chapter 1 illuminates for us. It illuminates for us the true nature of Christ. illuminates for us the true nature of sin and sinners. It illuminates the true, uh, the, the true nature of the believer's relationship with God. And it illuminates uh, for us the, the true nature of salvation, how it works. The last one, and I'm going to talk just a quick second on this because I think this is where all the application is this morning. John chapter 1 sheds light on the true nature of Christian ministry. I want you to note first that true Christian ministry is always Christ-centric. Never in the New Testament is Christian ministry described as being sheep-centric, leadership-centric, or community-centric. And so many churches right now are making one of those three things, if not all three, their primary purpose in their ministry. It is to meet the needs of the sheep. It is to accommodate oftentimes the egos of the leadership. Or it is to be a well-received, highly respected entity in our communities. John chapter 1 reveals for us and illuminates for us plainly Christian ministry is always Christ-centric. We're talking about two Johns this morning. We're talking about John the Apostle, who actually wrote the gospel. We're talking about John the Baptist that he talks about in those passages I read. John the Apostle never mentions his own name throughout his entire gospel. Most scholars agree that where he refers to the disciple whom Jesus loved, that he was talking about himself, but he never mentions himself by name in his gospel. And John the Baptist, whether you read it here or in the other synoptics, he is constantly getting the focus off of himself and onto Jesus. John 1 8, I read a while ago, he said that of John the Baptist, he came to testify about the life. John 1.20, John the Baptist himself said, I am not the Christ. 
John 1, 27, John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to even untie the strap of his sandal. In John 3, 30, a couple chapters over, John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Christian, true Christian ministry is always Christ-centric. And so many churches lose sight of that. Punning, here's another pun, lose sight of that. There's a million places in this sermon to, to do that. Second note that true Christian ministry always incorporates witnessing. John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John the apostle says, and we saw his glory. He's talking about at the transfiguration. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John later said in one of his epistles, you know, the, the epistles he's got further back in the New Testament, said in John, 1 John 1, 1, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was revealed, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was re revealed to us. Jesus told his disciples, he said, you're going to go out and be a witness to what you've seen and heard. You're going to be my witness. And no, we don't have the eyewitness testimony that the apostles had in 2022, those of us born in the last few decades. We were not eyewitnesses to these things. But you know what we have witnessed if we're truly born again? We've witnessed what happened to us. We've witnessed, the, we've witnessed our regeneration. We've witnessed our spiritual birth. And we are told in plain language that that is what we are to proclaim. That we know God and here's how we know him. Here's why we know him. And here's why he knows us. And Jesus says you are to testify about what you have witnessed. A lot of churches, they go off on these mission trips. They'll, they'll build a, they'll, they'll, they'll throw up a wall, stud up a wall, sheet rocket. I've, I've been on some of these trips. Never get around. They say, well, I'm going I'm to let my nailing be my witness. No, it doesn't work that way. You proclaim what you have witnessed. And this goes back to something then, thirdly, that I mentioned a while ago. True Christian ministry, first and foremost, targets people's beliefs. That is so important to understand. True Christian ministry targets and goes after what people believe. And that is the very thing churches don't want to do now. Well, I don't want to get in this theological debate. I don't want to confront them about, about where they're getting it wrong or where we disagree. Let's just focus on what we do agree on. We're right back in ecumenicalism, by the way, when we take that, take that strategy. I want you to notice in both John the Baptist and John, the Apostle John, their ministries targeted people's beliefs. Look at John 1, 7. John the Apostle is talking about John the Baptist. He said he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him, him John the Baptist. He came and testified so that people would believe what he was saying. And then in John 20, at the end of this gospel, John the Apostle tells us why he wrote the, the gospel to begin with. Listen to this, chapter 20, chapter 20, verse 30, John is wrapping up his gospel. He's coming to the end of it. He says this, so then many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus says, uh, John said, the reason I wrote this gospel to begin with is so that you will believe. I want to change your mind where you're not believing the right things. I want to go to that Unitarian church, the church of the river. And I want to explain 
Your beliefs have got you headed straight for hell at the moment. Why beliefs? Beliefs are the foundation of all of it. Churches have started these counseling services. They hire professional secular counselors and they want to come in. They want to deal with all the things people deal with. And they don't go after what they believe. Just, just one that comes to mind, anxiety. Anxiety is just rampant in our, in our society. People can't deal, you know, it's just, just anxiety. Dr. Field has made a fortune off of it. You've got all these people out here trying to deal with anxiety. You know where anxiety starts? It starts with the wrong belief. You don't believe God is in control. You don't believe God is sovereign. You don't believe God can handle this. You don't believe God is greater than he who's in the world, Satan. And that all starts with a wrong belief. True Christian ministry always targets what people believe. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to borrow a quote from C.S. Lewis. And I know a lot of people want to throw C.S. Lewis out. C.S. Lewis, had, he's problematic in some ways. He, had, he, had a, he was Anglican. And of course, there's some, there's some issues with that. But he, uh, he had a somewhat low view of the Old Testament. Uh, he believed some of it was myth, legend, wasn't actually true. Lewis has got his problems. And anytime you want to study C.S. Lewis, you have to be careful not to throw the, but you have to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you want to read the screw tape letters, if you want to read the great divorce, Lewis had the most ingenious insight into the workings of fallen man, I think, of any individual who's ever lived. And you cannot read those two works and not see yourself in every paragraph. There is a lot of, of, of almost otherworldly genius with C.S. Lewis that you have to be careful not to throw out when we throw out some of these other things that were problematic with him. But one of his most famous quotes and statements, he said this about Christianity. I quote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And I think what John the Apostle is telling us here in John chapter 1, I think he's saying you can believe that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, not necessarily, not necessarily because you've seen him, but because by him you can see everything else. What kind of things am I talking about? Talking about things like salvation, like sin, righteousness, the church, the family, marriage, abortion, government, justice. This could go on and on. The born again Christian views these things and forms their beliefs about these things based on the light of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, the church is out here telling people how you feel about things is, is matters. No, it doesn't. It's what God said about it. It's what matters. Then we change our feelings to match up with that truth. Now watch this. Jesus is the light of the world. But guess what else the New Testament tells us? Romans chapter 8, Paul said, Those who, quote, those who are in Christ are to be, quote, conformed to the image of Christ. In other words, those in Christ are to be the same light Jesus is, illuminating spiritual truth to a lost and dying world. And here's what Jesus said about it. Remember in John 8, he said, I'm the light of the world. Guess what else he said? And he's talking to his church. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. It's a reflected light, but not the source of the light. 
But you know what we call reflected light? Light. Reflected light is light. And that's the commandment from him. So my question today, have you truly received the light? There will be no better time than today than to do that. There will be no better time to ever have your eyes open to the truth. And there will never be a better time to receive it.